Hey all, this is Rob Ryder on Friday, uh, July 18, 2014. A quick little video going over some definitions that would be important to those who are already out trying to do this, right? We're going to the diocese cathedral to try to find answers. In cathedrals there's things called chapels. and A chapel is a religious place of fellowship, prayer, and worship that is attached to a larger, often non-religious institution or that is considered an extension of a primary religious institution. And we want the primary religious institution, which is the one universal church, not a local parish. And so in this chapel, they do prayer and worship. Well, prayer, an act of the virtue of religion, consists in asking proper gifts or grace from God. Uh, this may be done by acts of praise and thanksgiving, but petition is the principal act of prayer. Well, that's what we're doing. We're going to put a petition in. Now, I've already shown that Constantine made the, the bishops civil magistrates back in the 3rd century, 4th century, actually. They've been ever since. Uh, 1070, King uh, Edward I, I think it was, after the... Um, yeah, the Norman Conquest, he took what had been the sheriff and the bishop sitting together in court and said, now we're going to split this, and the bishop, you're going to have your jurisdiction, go and you go tell us where you're going to have it at, and over here where the sheriff was, this is going to be for non-contentious civil matters only. Right? Property transfers. Everybody's agreeable. Well, they've taken that court, and they've made it the court that they're sending us to, hiding the criminal um, jurisdiction, the contentious jurisdiction that the church has. And there's lots of people helping them, even within the church, but at the end of the day it has to be somewhere. And so within this, when you look at a cathedral, you got this big fancy looking church, but at the end of the day most of what you see is just a local parish, just like a parish church down from you. We want the chapel that's attached to the primary religious institution being the Catholic Church, Universal Church. So, be done in a chapel. Um, but let's get back to this. So, here's some definitions we've looked at before. So, we got a particular church. All right, a, in Catholic canon law, a particular church is an ecclesiastic community headed by a bishop or someone recognized as ha the equivalent of a bishop. Not everybody that's a bishop is a bishop. They just have the same functions as a bishop. All a bishop really is is a priest, ordained priest. There's not a separate ordination for bishop. You're, you can be an ordained deacon or an ordained priest. An ordained priest can be made a bishop. Right? Just another office he's given. He's just a priest. Uh, and they got So there's these local particular churches. In the Catholic teaching, each diocese is also a local or particular church. And we don't want it to be local, right? We want it to be particular. Because it's the particular church that is a member of the universal church. And so this big ass cathedral has a local parish with local parish offices, just like your parish has a parish office or any church has a parish office, but somewhere within this compound has to be an office of chancery for a diocesan business. A diocese is a section of the people of God and trust to the bishop to be guided by him uh, and the assistance of his clergy, so a loyal pastor is formed by loyal to its pastor and formed by him into a community in the Holy Spirit through the Gospel and Eucharist. It consists one particular church in which the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ is truly present and active. You know, big ass complex, and that's the part we want to find. Uh, so a cathedral comes from the word seat, Christian church, which contains the seat of a bishop, thus serving as the central church of the diocese. So there's one giveaway, right? The seat of the bishop. The word cathedral is derived from the Greek word cathedra, seat or chair, and refers to the presence and prominence of a bishop's or archbishop's chair or throne. Two different things, a chair or a throne. Raised above both clergy and laity, and 
originally located facing the congregation from behind the high altar. Now, if you were to look at um, what could be um, a bishop's throne sitting there at the high altar at the end of this um, uh, basilica, which is the, the, the normal form of a um, cathedral, you may see a chair like that. But sometimes, I don't know, I've looked at it and said, well, you don't. But then you find out, oh, you know what? Raised could be it's on the second floor. Raised. We'll see why that is in a second. And you just don't happen to see it because they're not showing it to you. But it doesn't mean it isn't there. And it goes back to the way they were first started in the first place. So, um, so anyways, a raised throne in a basilican hall was also definitive of late antique pre presiding magistrate. So it's good to have that. It means, okay, I'm in the right place, right? Within this structure is a presiding magistrate. And so the cathedral also symbolizes the bishop's role in governing his diocese. Amongst the accusations, uh, this is, now this was a guy named Paul. He was the bishop of Antioch back in 256. So still during what should have been Christian persecution times, you know, the, the church hadn't been recognized by Constantine until 319 or something like that, 300 and something. Um, so this is 256 this is happening. And he had the civil rank of a magistrate, basically. And he was also the bishop of Antioch. And so he, they say he improperly erected an enclosure or secretum, secret room, basically. And within this enclosure, he had erected a throne from which he presided in worship, and that he trained female choir to sing hymns on his own devising. So that's the bishop's private trap. This bishop's private chapel, we'll see, that you get to from the bishop's residence through a secret walkway that goes to a room above a sacristy on the first floor. And so above is a chapel, below is a sacristy, which is where all the vestments are kept for church and certain other things need to be kept in there. And so you could either take him upstairs to his chapel or you could go out the side door and go into the main chapel to the parish. So it was a dual use room. But the the part of the church we want is sitting above this room, not on the main floor. That's just a parish like yours. We want the bishop's private chapel, or so it appears. So, anyways, they, they so they uh, I think they ended up excommunicating this dude. I mean, they were they were hitting him pretty hard. Um, yet within a hundred years, all bishops in the Mediterranean would had cathedrals, all sat on thrones within an enclosed sanctuary space. And why is that? Well, because a hundred years later it was three fifty six, and by then all the bishops have been made civil magistrates. The driving principle underlying this change was the acceptance by bishops, more or less willingly, of an imperial invitation to adopt and maintain the duties, dignity, and insignia proper to a public magistrate. Okay, so in cathedrals, certainly almost always found, you got the basilica, that's like the main hall, then you got the baptistries, um, and originally, the bishop and the, cler the cathedral clergy formed a kind of religious community, and they stayed in a building called the rectory, or whatever it would have been called. And then over time, that's all changed. So in old Europe, they had this, th this group called the um, cathedral chapter. And they were 12 priests and seven deacons who um, worked at the cathedral. Except they didn't really work there. This is the problem. That's that's where they had their benefice through. And so what these really were were like the king's younger brothers or um, younger sons, so forth. They couldn't be king, and they gave them a job with a benefice that came with property, and so forth and so on. And that's what they did. And they just got together with the bishop once in a while because the bishop had to have their permission to do something. All right, that's the way that it was at one time. And so they had stand-ins. Um, basically, their vicars, their deputies, go actually do the functions at the church. They were never there. Well, we never had that system in America. That would have been what was called the uh, uh, 
cathedral chapter. And they never adopted that in America or in many places. In fact, it's never been adopted. Um, what we have are called diocesan consultors who took the place of the cathedral chapter. Well, if they're going to take the place of the cathedral chapter, they still have to be at the cathedral. Everything we need to do is at the cathedral. Because it was this cathedral chapter that was the senate for the bishop. And now we have these other guys called the diocesan consultors playing the same part as the senate for the bishop. Um, so, you know, one of the guys I, I believe, well, I'm sure it is, is the rector. He's like the head of this group of priests and deacons at work at the diocese cathedral. Okay, so the, uh, the alternative to this was a cathedral ruled by a secular chapter. The dignities of provost, dean, precentor, chancellor, treasurer, that's where they came from. And so they were the deputies of this cathedral chapter, we just talked about the secular chapter, because while the non-residents of the canons, who the secular chapter was, rather than their perpetual residence became the rule and led to their duties being performed by a body of vicars, the provost, the dean, the precentor, the chancellor, the treasurer, who officiated for them at the services at the church. So they were the um, officialis. The provost, who was occasionally an archdeacon as well as remaining head of the chapter. Right, so way back five or six videos ago, we were looking for the provost or the archdeacon or the dean or whoever it was, whatever name they were using today, that could give us a canonical institution into the office of the ostrary, which I believe is the same as the Ministry of the Hospitality now, which they still have, as mentioned by Pope Francis. And so if you were to think about it, if you were to take this office, which they could give a seven-year-old, so there was no training necessary, to be the doorkeeper, you're a watchtower man. You're supposed to watch the kingdom of heaven. You're a keeper of the gate. And so if they gave you that office in the church, well, you would now be a citizen of the Vatican City State because all citizens of the Vatican City State are officers in the church. All these priests and people that we see in the local parish, they're just employees. And the ones at the cathedral, they are in the church, but they've taken a vow and they've given up their sovereignty, basically. They're servants. You're going to, so they can't be a citizen of the, they can't be a citizen of the, uh, uh, of the Holy See because they're servants. Right? They gave up their sovereignty. Well, we're going to keep our sovereignty. We're one of the king of kings kings, and we're just going to go in and take this off as a doorkeeper. Everybody in the garden has the same inheritance from the father, and we're supposed to go out and heal the sick, help the poor. That's why I see it. But we got to go here and change our status and get our domicile established within the universal church instead of where they have our records now, which is at a local parish. So all this is to say we're going to take some papers or at least go to a particular office and have a conversation and convince them that our rights within the church are being damaged and either change it or we want a court case. Uh, so the, bishop, the chapter of the bishop. In both cases, the chapter was the bishop's concilium, his senate basically, which he was bound to consult in all important matters without doing so he could not act. Births, marriages, and deaths are often celebrated by services at cathedrals, and the cathedral often acts as repository of local history by recording these events. How many people have taken their birth record down to the frickin' diocese chancery to have it recorded? Or your death certificate for your loved one? You know, we can get these documents, but what are we supposed to do with them? I think we're supposed to be taken to the cathedral to a special office in the cathedral, to the chancery office. Cathedrals are often associated with significant secular organizations, such as the office of local mayor and council, the local court. Yeah, it's pretty much tied in. 
Originally, the bishop's cathedral stood in the center of the apse, flanked on either side through the lower plane uh, by benches of the assisting priest. Stood at the center of the apse. I have to go see where that is. Flanked on either side through a lower plane so that his would sit higher by benches of assisting. Right, So the bishop should be sitting a little bit taller. Uh, the term for the official seat of the bishops is employed in the bishop's church. Blank. The term for the official seat of the bishop thus employed for the bishop's church. Oh, I, I must have cut that out of something else. I, maybe I missed it. Anyways, it's the official seat of the bishop. That's what we're looking for. And that will be at the bishop's church. And so you could have this throne sitting out there in the church. But there's a thing called the fold stool. A movable folding chair used in pontifical functions by the bishop outside of his cathedral or within if it is not at his if he's not at his throne or cathedral. Other prelates enjoying the privileges of full pontifical pontificals also use it. So if somebody at the church has been given a special office by the Pope and it has special functions to do, they can go sit in the seat. And they're supposed to have a slip cover they put over it, indicating what rank they are and what they can do. But here's some of the things it was used for. The Rubik's prescribed in the seat in the conferring of baptism, right? So it was supposed to be used in baptism and holy orders. In the consecration of oils on uh, Mound Day Tuesday and uh, ceremonies, Mound Day Monday, Thursday. It's a special day where they consecrate these oils, holy oils, which we'll talk about some other time. Red, green, violet cloths were ordered as coverings to correspond with the season or rank of the prelate. It may have once been something like a camp stool and it accompanied the bishop in his journeys. If it be a cathedral chapter, however, its principal object is to assist the bishop in government of his diocese. This was talking about these different chapters, because you can have rural chapters also, but it's the cathedral chapter was the only one that had anything to do with the government of the diocese. The rural, diocese, the rural chapters were just little groups that got together of local parishes to make these little deaneries but they had nothing to do with the government of the diocese. And unfortunately, that's who we keep going to. When we go to the Diocese of Grand Rapids office, instead of going to the Cathedral of St. Andrew's Chancery. Members of chapters are called canons. And again, we don't have these chapters anymore. We got something different. A chapter can be considered as forming one body with the bishop in as far as it constitutes its, his senate and aids him in the government of the diocese. Or it can be another body, I don't think I put it in here, but where it's taking care of its own internal affairs. So the only time that they are working for the bishop is when they're called to a meeting. Otherwise they're doing they're running a local parish. It happens to be a really pretty church. Uh, they also have a certain preeminence that they may be made judge, delegate of the Holy See in preference to other clergy and to canons of collegiate churches. This is the thing about, because another name for these guys, go figure, capitulars. Cathedral canons. We don't have those. We got diocesan consultors who have replaced the cathedral, cathedral canons, doing the same job have precedence after the bishop or vicar general over the diocese over all diocese and clergy when they go on procession as a chapter. They have also certain preeminence so that they may be made judges delegate of the Holy See in preference to other clergy and to canons of collegiate churches. These are the judges, the small group that works at the cathedral. In the United States, cathedral chapters have not been constituted. In 1838, propaganda consulted the American bishops and advisory of erecting them, but the priest judged that time. And all that was in that book I sent out about diocesan consultors. You should Google that. I'm sure the book will come up on the first page. Go read it. First couple chapters, at least about the history, so you get an idea. Okay, all they're doing is they're taking what used to be because the church had been there for centuries and we're going to go to America where it's never been. We can't use the same system. We won't call them this. We're going to call them this instead. And we're going to go to a corporate system 
where all the real power is just held in a few hands over in Rome. However, if you go to the right office, even local, that's part of the universal church, and that's what we that's what we failed to have. It's what we have failed to get to, is the universal church. We're always dealing with a local parish that doesn't have anything to do with the government of the diocese. And it's just the way it is. Let's see what else we had here. The Chantry Office, the official center of diocesan business, will be found properly at the cathedral, even though the bishop uh, resides elsewhere. And that's in this uh, thing about ecclesiastical residence. I remain in and abiding where one's duties lie and where one's occupation is properly carried out. Didn't say about sleeping there. As the presence of a bishop in his diocese, a rector in the, or incumbent in his benefice, a canon in his cathedral, or collegiate church, opposed to a non-residence or absence. Like the canons used to be when they weren't in the cathedral. Residence is intended to guarantee service or fulfillment of duty. Pretty simple. You don't need to sleep there, it's need, but it is where you need to be doing your work out of. It's a laborious residence. Alone satisfies the requirements. Nothing to do with sleeping. It may be noted that by fictional law, one who is lawfully absent fulfills the law of residence. Go figure, they could use fictions. Can is not obliged ordinarily to dwell close to his proximity of his benefice. It suffices that he is able to conveniently be present at prescribed hours. But we don't have canons here in America. Um, but this is the main thing right here, right? I've, I've already gone through this once in another video. The Chancery Office. The Chancery Office. The Chancery Office. The official center of diocesan business, lowercase diocesan business, will be found more properly at the cathedral. Even though the bishop resides elsewhere. And this big-ass complex is all part of the cathedral. We're going to see that this chancery office could have been in this building called the rectory. In fact, um, let's go read about that right now. Did that one. And we talked about the chapel. All right. Prayer and worship. Prayer is done by a petition, is the principal act of prayer. Read anything in law, what are you supposed to do? Put in a petition. There you go. Right, you're praying for relief to somebody who says he's gonna that he represents Christ, and when he agrees with you, no matter what anybody else says on the face of the earth, you're gonna get your remedy. It's coming from God. He's just there to make sure God's law is followed, but he can only do it from one office. Got to be sitting in that chair or on that little fold stool, because either we need to have a court case or we need a declaratory judgment, right? Which is just paperwork with a seal on it. And that would still come out of the Court of Chancery. Looking for that Court of Chancery. So, um, rectory and chancery. So a rectory is an official house, lodging, or a residence of a priest, either assigned in a parish church, cathedral, university. We term it as a clergy house and usually called presbytery. It functions as the administrative office of a local parish. So the rectory as called is tied to the local parish with administrative office. Chancery is the office of the diocese, right? Rectory is the office of the parish, real simple. Chancery is the office of the diocese where the pastoral, canonical, and sacramental governments of the diocese takes place. Financial records and sacramental documents of the parishes are kept. As you have seen it, our rectory and chancery are situated in just one place. And if you noticed, our chancery is just one room, right? So in this case, the chancery was a room within a rectory. So you couldn't go to the parish offices. You had to go to the chancery offices. After a series of monthly clergy assemblies, we have discussed and agreed to restructure the whole rectory as a complete chancery and to build a rectory at the vacant lot near the St. Joseph's Formation Center. How much you want to bet this monthly clergy assembly had to do with them diocesan consultors? Sitting as the Bishop's Senate because he's making major changes to the way that the 
diocese is run. Right, also called a clergy house. Clergy houses frequently serve as administrative office of local parishes as well as a residence. Right? As well as what kind of residence? An Episcopal residence. Right? The Episcopal residence, or th that's where the, the chancery work is done at. A rectory is a residence, a former residence of an ecclesiastical rector. Now, Episcopal residence. This is down in Corpus Christi, Texas. So prior to the dedication of the present Corpus Christi Cathedral Rectory, in 1979, so they dedicated a building in 1979. Before that, the clergy and parish had their offices and living quarters in the present chancery building behind the cathedral church. Right? So the rectory used to be in the chancery building. But in 1979, they must have built a new rectory, and you know, the chancery stayed where the chancery was, and the rectory moved. However, possibly only older Catholics may remember that the building was intended by the bishop to serve as the Episcopal residence along with diocesan offices. What building? The present Chancery building. Because prior to the dedication, in 1979 the clergy of the parish had their office and living quarters in the present Chancery building behind the Cathedral Church. However, possibly only older Catholics may remember that the building, what building? The Chancery building, where the, they used to stay back in the day, was intended by the bishop to serve also as the Episcopal residence along with the diocesan offices. Right? And it's the Episcopal residence that has to do with uh, when he's performing his duties as part of the Episcopate of the Universal Catholic Church. At the time of the dedication of the new Corpus Christi Cathedral in 1940, the bishop had already requested the same architect as Oklahoma City design and construct a new residence, new residence, new rectory nearby to the cathedral to serve both the bishop and the cathedral clergy for the future. They both had their own needs, one as the local parish and one as the diocesan offices. The initial plan was around 1940, uh, and then of course we had the war, had to wait a little bit. Um, meanwhile, in order to watch over the new church, because the church was built, they were just talking about the rectory slash cathedral, or uh, uh, chancery, right? One Every night, somebody slept in a room above the new cathedral priest of sacristy. I wonder what that room would be. Wait till we find out. Multiple times, architect asked, uh, they made changes, wanted a complete project prior to retirement. It became his final residence, yada yada yada, okay, in 1948, and then he wrote, a, then he wrote to one of his friends. Um, the bishop invited Kempler to check out the new facilities and reported that he had just finished moving most of my chapel furniture to the chapel in the cathedral above the priest sacristy. The room right above the new cathedral priest sacristy. It was just a room then, now it's become a chapel. The bishop was only in his new residence for a few months when he is retired, and the immediate installation of his of his coadjutor bishop, another bishop, was announced. The local newspaper noted that uh, the new, the old bishop, had just turned 80. That he had served as chief shepherd of the diocese of Corpus Christi for 28 years. At his arrival, 22,000 miles. Blah, blah, Okay, so the old bishop resided at the new Episcopal residence until his death in 1952. Like it, the former residence built by a different bishop in 1915, the new structure housed offices of both the bishop and the cathedral clergy. Two different kinds of offices, one for the bishop, one for the cathedral clergy. What cathedral clergy? The local parish, parish offices. However, it also prompted his successor, the new bishop, to seek a separate dwelling to serve as his residence while he maintained his diocesan offices at the rectory slash chancery building. Right? So the, the new bishop didn't stay there, he, so he didn't sleep there. He went and found someplace else to sleep, but he kept his offices there. That's all I got to do. 
The entrance of the chancery was through doors running on Lippin Street, while the entrance to the cathedral parish offices was at the top of a stairway on the east side of the building, opposite of an outside stairway leading to the cathedral church sacristy. Well, where the heck is that? One you could walk in the front door, the other one you came in, you know, through some side secret door. The old bishop even had an enclosed walkway extending from the floor of his living quarters to the second floor sacristy of the cathedral where he had a private chapel for prayers and daily mass. Right, he had an enclosed walkway. He had his own tunnel. Nobody knew he was going to his to his cathedral or to his chapel which sits on the second floor sacristy within the cathedral. I'll look at that in just a second. Let me finish this up. Um, 1949, it showed that both the bishops, as well as uh, the pastor, that would be the rector, I believe, and his associates claimed 620 as their residence, right, to do their work out of. Because the pastor of the cathedral parish and his deacons and so forth have parish offices and the two bishops have diocesan offices. Probably Bishop gave best description of his new facility in a letter to the bishop. He described the arcade bridge from the residence to the cathedral, his private chapel, above the priest's sacristy, and the many rooms. He noted that the structure was particularly or practically fireproof. Duh! I wonder if they got a fireproof vault built in there. Right? When they talk about the safe, it's a frickin' vault. Just like going into the records office at the courthouse. The first floor with the separate Chancery Cathedral entrances contained the rectory reception room and two instruction rooms, the dining room, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, however, those projects remain for the new bishop to continue. Meanwhile, the new bishop began a tradition Okay, he began a tradition, so apparently still being done by the bishop, purchasing a residence removed from the work of the chancery and cathedral that afforded him some privacy while providing room for visiting prelates. So they don't sleep at the where they do their work. And their work is done at the chancery. And in the chancery he's got a private chapel, and in a chapel is where you Submit prayers. And prayers are done by petition. So maybe we just take it to, the, to his chancery office. Ah, he purchased, okay. An Episcopal residence and a chancery office, and then appointed uh, officials needed. This is a different place. So this thing about an Episcopal residence, chancery, rectories, so forth and so on, they all kind of fit together. Um, so anywho, um, I'm going to stop just for a second here. Figure out. Okay, um, the freedom in the erection of chapels had soon to be restricted. There being as yet no parochial system, as now understood, it became necessary to safeguard the jurisdiction of the city bishop throughout the circumscription of influence and activity recognized as belonging to the cathedral or mother church. So I think anytime you see a cathedral, the cathedral is attached to the bishop. If it's a parish, it's attached to a parish priest. And that could be of interest because uh, other buildings such as courthouses, hospitals, and of course all religious houses and other and their granges had chapels attached to them in medieval times. Right? Is there a, is there a chapel in the courthouse? You find the chapel, then if there's a priest that's been attached to it, it's from the um, it's from the bishop. There's all sorts of chapels. I don't want to get in all these, but let's just uh, I'm about done with this. But this is um, Handcuff John went to uh, the uh, cathedral in uh, Richmond, Virginia. It's called the Cathedral of Sacred Heart. 
It's got a self-guided tour. And then he talked to some people there and said, well, you can have somebody give you a guided tour and just need to tell us what you want to see. And he went here because we had already talked about this, that somewhere here should be the guy we need to talk to. It's probably the rector. So he ended up going to the parish offices after he did a little walkthrough here and took some pictures that we'll share. Um, and he went to the parish offices and talked to the lady there about, um, you know, he may have some errors in his sacramental records. And as it turns out, that's what she's working on there in the parish offices. But she says, well, <laughs> you would need to talk to the rector. Or John said he thinks he needs to talk to the rector. I'm not sure. But either way, the, she said, well, the rector's only here two days a week. And he spends two days a week over at uh, the diocese uh, of Richmond building, which isn't at the cathedral, obviously. And, um, you know, so he would have to make an appointment. And uh, so that's what he's going to do. But she did say his office was upstairs. He has his own office upstairs, separate from this parish office. So that could be where the uh, the chantry office is. At, at the time we didn't know to call it that or to ask her that, but um, it's interesting she's working on errors in parish records right now. See, because if they were just to, if the church was to take it on themselves just to fix the errors in the records and take our records that are now held in the parish and put them in the diocese and chancery anybody that that was done to would become a citizen of the Vatican City State. Holy See Passport. At least have access to your account. You would now be sui juris. They'd have to sue you in your own name. Right now they don't sue you in your name. They sue you in a fictitious name. Mine is Rutluski, Robert Allen. Who the hell is that dude? I don't know. They don't sue me in the name Robert Allen Rutluski. That may be on the paperwork and all cats, but that's my legal person. That's my property. It's the name of my estate. It is my property. Everybody tells you different. They're incorrect. It's your property. It's it's what has your inheritance from the Father when you get your ass back in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Right now we're lost beyond the sea. we got to get into the Holy See. Or plan of a cathedral. So, at the end of the day, that's kind of what they look like, right? You walk in down here, and you go in, and pff, this is where they're holding mass up here. There's the altar. This is the nave where everybody sits. This should be this area up here between the middle. That should be where the choir is, I would think, but I don't know. Maybe it isn't. Looks like the seats are facing in. And then these seats will be facing this way. And in the choir area, the seats are supposed to be facing towards the center. That's where all the dignitaries are supposed to sit. And what else was there? Up here at 8, that's where the bishop's seat is. I think this is a little bigger now. That's where the bishop's seat is. So we'll take a look at a picture of one. But this 10 here, now 10 is a sacristy. This is right here. All right now, are we looking at the first floor level or second floor level? I say we're looking at the first floor level. Doesn't mean it's not a two-story building. You're just looking at the plane of the first level. Down on this end, also, this is a auxiliary sacristy at five. Six was a um, uh, a reconciliation chapel. So it's a chapel. It's a chapel within a church, right? But it's a chapel for special functions and so forth. Because the chapel is attached to the bishop, not to the local church. Because all this out here, this is all the local church. They just have a really nice parish. Uh, three was the baptismal font. Four was where they kept the holy oils which they're supposed to use in baptism as it turns out and it's uh, used as part of an exorcism at baptism ensuring that there is no demon in you and then breathing into you by the anointing which has been breathed on by the bishop just like Christ breathed on his um, what did he do? Did he do that to the I think he just did it to his disciples breathed on him. It breathed in the Holy Ghost um, 
there you go. And so they use these oils as part of an exorcism, and they say that baptism is part of an exor exorcism, exercising any demons replacing it with the Holy Ghost. So if you weren't anointed, and when you're anointed as part of this baptism, you're anointed the same as a king or a queen, because you are anointed a prophet, a priest, and a king within a church, and that gives you the office of Christ. You're the Antichrist. You're another Christ. You're not Jesus Christ. You're another one. A Christ is an office. It's not a person. It's an office. Office of Christ is anyone who's been anointed a priest, a prophet, and a king. And you will be. So anyways, if this was the second floor above this building then, or number 10, is where the bishop's um, chapel could be. Hey, you know, it could be over this. Oh, well, that's an awful small room, and it's at the front, and I don't know that it is, but it could be where his chapel is. And so in, in this five, I'm, I think they're keeping things for this um, reconciliation uh, chapel. But as you can see, this one here, right, they could, because in the room is the things they keep they're going to use during the service. So they could walk out this door and be over here. Or they could go up some stairs and be in the chapel. It's just where's the mass being held? Where's the prayer going to be heard? Now let's look at some pictures that John sent. I think it's pretty interesting. Okay, so when you walked in the front door, get down to where this is, most of this stuff is all down here, we're looking at six, and six is the Reconciliation Cathedral. Actually, I don't know that that's what they call it here. They actually call it the Baptistry Gallery and the Reconciliation Room. All right, but what it is is a room that has a frickin' shield of the uh, diocese on it. You don't see that on every door. And above it, it calls it the Reconciliation Chapel. So it's more than a room, it's a chapel. And in here, apparently, they have a display for um, the history of baptisms within the diocese, I guess. So there's some baptismal things in there, but I don't know that that's what they're doing in there, although they could be, because it's in there. Because um, they have a baptistry. Look at the floor plan. Out here in the in the in what's called the nave of the church. Okay, so. Got a door with a shield on it. That door was locked, John said. Yeah, okay. And when he looked in the door, that was the stuff you saw. These are all things that have been used at, for baptisms at some point in history, apparently. Not here to give you a history lesson. But from there, looking into the church, this thing to the left, this is the baptistry that they show in number three. Interesting is uh, they show that with a dark block, and then uh, they show other things with just a light block. That is. Because this over here is where the holy oils are kept. The oils used in exorcism and used in confirmation and baptism, which is an exorcism. It's the exorcism of baptism. And they're supposed to, um, sort of like the water represents the demon leaving you, and the oil represents the Holy Spirit coming in. show you though because this is uh... okay so this is the sacristy the auxiliary sacristy across the way from the this is number five called the sacristy 
The interesting thing is that's got a freaking mail slot in it. I don't remember what John said. It said it says something in the mail slot, and I can't read it. I don't remember what he said it was. But it's like, well, how do you get mail in that mail slot? I want to send mail there. If I can't talk to somebody, I'll send mail that sacristy. And then the sign was on the way going in, right? Welcome to the cathedral where all who enter here are counted as parishioners. And as good as that sounds, we want to stop. We don't want to go any further. You go in there, you just walked into the local parish. Right? We're not trying to get into the local parish. We're trying to get into the diocesan cathedral. Uh, diocesan chancery. Into the universal church's records. Don't want to be in the parish. So that beautiful looking building, all that ornate stuff that, that, that the um, that the bishop did decide, well, I'm going to use this as my church, right? Good for him. Yeah, I'll make this my home, right? It's, it's mainly just a local parish. And the parts that aren't local are what might be above 10. The, you know, that's where the bishop's private uh, chapel is. And 6, because it's a chapel, and chapels are can be that they're connected to some other um Something else. Where did I say that in here? Because oh, there's a bunch of different kinds of chapels. I wasn't going to read this whole thing, but this is the spread of Christianity from cities to the county and uh, country. Occasion the erection of oratories and chapels for the use of believers living at a distance from the bishop's church. So if you find a chapel, it's still part of the bishop's church. If you find a parish, that ain't part of the bishop's church. Okay, the freedom, uh, they had to curtail it, right? Um, Recognizes belonging to the cathedral or mother church, right? That's what they had to make sure of. Um, hang on just a second here. <clears throat> 